My name is Matt Farmer, uh, and I'm here today to uh, talk about the, the case for the cutting edge. Um, so I, I thought it was really interesting when they placed me kind of in this track because you, you guys are, are dealing with a lot of, hey, uh, you know, here's this awesome library and here's this awesome technique and I'm going to come in here and talk about all this human stuff. So I guess they figured that if you were following this track, you would need a break from having your brain melted the entire time with things like Scala Z and stuff like that. So um, I'm, I'm here to basically talk about uh, kind of our experience at my company with choosing Scala and Clojure and my hope is, is that, at the, that at the end of this talk, um, if you're in an organization that is not currently using some newer technology that you've had difficulty selling to people that work at your organization, that you'll have, a, you'll have an example of, of somebody to point to and say, hey, these guys are doing this really well. Here are some things they said about what they learned in this process and, and this, that, and the other. So uh, without like any uh, further delay. I don't think that I'll, I'll need to work very hard to find very many people in this room that think functional programming languages are awesome. Uh, if, if I do need to work hard to convince you of that, this was an interesting choice of a conference for you to attend. Um, but I'm glad you're here anyway. And like I said, uh, I suspect there are a lot of us that have had this experience of trying to sell uh, functional programming or maybe, maybe for you, it's you've tried to sell using DevOps instead of a conventional like you know server management strategy over you know over your organization or whatever. And it's interesting that we 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 so often get pushback on these new things. Like new things are a little bit scary to people sometimes, which is interesting because the mantle of the technology industry is to innovate, and the mantle of the technologist in that industry is to innovate innovation. So this is, this is an important thing for us to figure out how to, how to do, is to communicate that, hey, we can do this successfully. So uh, to do that, uh, I'm basically going to be, like I said, using uh, the company that I work for as an example. Uh, the, the rough agenda is I'm just going to go over who we are real quick, just so that you have some context for just what we're doing and, and where we're coming from in this. Uh, I'm going to go through three particular lessons that we've learned in the process of making this choice. And I'm going to end with kind of why this is something that I think is worthwhile for any organization to explore, uh, be it, like I said, for Scala, for DevOps, for whatever. Uh, and so that's kind of our game plan. So uh, I work for a company called Alemica. And there's a question that I get quite frequently. Uh, and I, I think that the best rendering of it is in, in the bobs. What would you say that you do here? That's, this, is, this is something that, that I get a lot because not very many people outside the supply chain space have heard of us. But the kind of term for what we are is a supply chain operating network. Now, if you're inside the supply chain space, once again, that, that probably means something to you. Uh, if you're not, uh, then your response will probably be very similar to that of a college buddy of mine when, when I sent him that response, which was this. Which is fair. Uh, that, that, that there is a little bit of buzzwordy feeling to that if you're outside the supply chain industry. But without going too far into detail with it, I'll give you some rough numbers that give you an idea of the landscape that we're working in. Uh, which is, you know, we, we move about a third of a trillion dollars worth of industrial transactions over our network. To do that, we support 200 different message format type and version combinations in order to make that communication happen. And we have industrial grade uptime and performance requirements. Because if our system goes down or malfunctions, the possible failure conditions include factories having to halt production. Uh, they include deliveries not being loaded or you know, being delivered to the wrong place. Uh, and deliveries can include things like chemicals, which is really bad if those go to the wrong location. So that's kind of the context we're working in. We're not playing in a, in a perfect world sandbox. Like, we've got a lot of, of things going on that are very important. And we've chosen these, these technologies, Scala and Clojure, in order to actually make that happen. So that's kind of where we're coming from. And, uh, now I'm going to kind of go into some of the things that we've learned in the process of pursuing these technologies. And uh, we'll go from there. So uh, lesson one is engineering isn't lost in translation. 
So to most of us, this, this may not be a novel concept. Um, you know, it's, but, but it's the thing that when I'm trying to pitch Scala and Clojure to somebody that's in a decision-making position, the first thing that they look at right off the bat is the talent pool size. So they, they do something like, you know, go on uh, hot, like Glassdoor or something like that and take a look at, okay, well, how many, how many, how many Scala engineers are out there? How many Clojure engineers are out there? And they're not entirely wrong to do that. It, it, being able to hire people for your organization is a valid concern. And, you know, being able to uh, use a technology that's popular enough to be able to hire people is a is, is reasonable conclusion to come to. And so if you're following that conclusion, they're not entirely wrong. Uh, Redmonk periodically publishes language rankings based on GitHub and Stack Overflow activity. In the uh, rankings that were published in January, Scala ranked 14th, and Clojure tied Groovy for the 19th spot. So if you're looking at that as a business person without an engineering background, that's not entirely confidence inspiring, right? But let's, let's put that aside for a minute. Let's take a look at, at, at an actual example of us attempting to hire people at Alimica. Uh, so this was from about uh, six, six to eight months ago, I think, uh, when we sent out uh, basically a job ad to several different websites. And we got about 60 high quality responses out of that. And it's throwing away all of the recruiters that send you emails, say, hey, please use my services, and things like that. And of those 60 responses, about five of them had prior Scala experience. That's about 8.3%, which is not exactly confidence inspiring from just looking at a number standpoint. So if we were to consider this what we're hiring for, then almost 92% of the applicants didn't meet this description. But we kind of realized something, and I'm sure that, that you have as well at this point already, is that many of us at Alimica didn't start out knowing Scala. There was a time before we knew Scala. And it turns out that we're pretty good Scala engineers in spite of that, in spite of not coming out of the womb already knowing about Scala. So that was kind of, that's kind of an important realization for us to communicate to the people that need to actually have the final say in what the company is going to do. And acknowledging that allows us to be a bit more honest about what we actually need, which is a software engineer. And it's true. There are plenty of other limiting factors that go into hiring somebody, uh, the most of, important of which is knowing how to pronounce the word GIF, obviously. And, you know, that's... That's an important distinction to make, is that engineering isn't lost in translation, that you know, we have the, the ability to translate engineering skill between a language or a particular technology stack and be successful wherever we're landing as a result of that. And by doing that, we open ourselves up to a lot of new blood and we get to be a part of expanding the scale of talent market as well. So that's one. Uh, two is embrace the elbow grease. So I, I, I talk to a lot of different people about uh, languages and, and things like that in Atlanta. And one of the knocks that I hear about Scala and Clojure uh, is usually from people coming from outside of the Java ecosystem. Uh, and they, they tend to quantify this in terms of library counts for whatever reason. They say, well, you know, I, you know, Ruby has so many gems that I have a high level of confidence that I can go and get something. And I, I don't know why that seems to be the case. Maybe that's just been my unique experience. I'm not sure. But it, it's a bit weird because I don't particularly find myself hunting for libraries or, or being at a loss for a library that often. The Java ecosystem itself is pretty rich. And there's, there's a lot that's already out there that, that other people have done. And you, know, you occasionally end up with situations where you need to basically reinvent the wheel on something because, for one reason or another. But by and large, the Java ecosystem has a lot to offer us. And the other thing is, is that this is a, like, thinking about this in terms of library accounts is a bit weird because honestly, library accounts are, seem to be most helpful at the beginning of a project when you're first getting started. So if you're thinking in terms of a longer time frame, it makes more sense to ensure that you're choosing a tool that lets you optimize for the hard things. 
And that's the attitude that we've taken with it at Alimica. Because it's essentially by choosing Scala, yeah, we had, we had a bit more work than somebody that can just use a Rails generator to get our application up and running. But now that we're at a point where we're past that, where we're into the meat of solving the hard problems, we found that for us, Scala, presented, Scala Enclosure presented an opportunity uh, for us to be more productive when we're in the middle of those hard problems. And that's for various reasons. One of them is the type system. That actually helps us out a lot. Another one is that the concise uh, syntax allows us to fit more context in one window. We're not hunting around in a file looking for something. And those are, those are things that can change based on your team, based on your problem space, whatever. So the, the idea is to basically embrace that the hard things are going to happen regardless of what language it is that you've chosen. And when you're thinking about what tools you want to select, you need to select the ones that are going to do the best for you when you hit those hard problems. So the, the kind of final thing that we've, we've learned that we've, we've got to do is engage the learning curve. And that actually has kind of two parts to it. The first one is for ourselves. And part of choosing to uh, approach newer technologies implies you've got to be willing to spend some time learning. And you've got to communicate that that time is going to be needed to the people that need to know. And ultimately, I think that's a, that's a good thing for us as engineers, is to communicate the value of that learning time that, that we spend exploring. Because ultimately, that makes us more valuable to the people that, that are a part of our organizations and uh, you know, ultimately cr promotes a culture of people that are learning consistently. Uh, and the second one is in new team members. So something that I think that a lot of organizations deal with, this probably isn't unique to us, but onboarding new people is hard sometimes. And especially if you're onboarding somebody that doesn't have prior experience in the technology stack that you're using, that's something that you have to pay extra close attention to. And we've had our own struggles with that at Alimica, with getting our onboarding process to a place where when we bring somebody in, they're not going to spend a month and a half just being frustrated because they can't get anything done. That's not what you want to happen. And so we've tried very hard to kind of engage that learning curve and uh, be very intentional both at a personal level and at an onboarding level uh, about how we learn being conscious of making that time available to people on the team and uh, other things like that. So those are kind of the, the, the three things that you know, we've kind of taken away uh, in summary. Um, three big lessons that we kind of experienced uh, in the process of making this choice. And you know, as a result of that, we have kind of been doing very well with, with this in spite of the challenges that it presents in terms of communicating the value, in terms of training new people. We've, we've had a really great experience. But even looking at that great experience uh, back the other direction, it's, it's a hard choice for an organization level to make. You know, it's, it's one of those things that uh, it involves a good bit of risk uh, from the point of view of the organization, and it involves a lot of conversations. It involves a lot of communication in order to make that happen. And, you know, ultimately one of the things that we've, that I've found through that is that, uh, my slide's going to go? There we go. Uh, is that it's a decision that's worth it. And I'm, I'm basically looking at this from my perspective as an engineer. But what I see when I look at the effect that this has had on our organization is that by choosing to abandon this notion of an engineering skill being limited to one language, it's given us the opportunity to hire the best people regardless of what their background is, regardless of uh, you know, whether or not um, they've written a line of Scala before. 
like we have people that have backgrounds in the restaurant industry that have always just really enjoyed computer science. And we have people whose backgrounds are in classical music that you know, then learned Ruby and then came to work for us. And those are some of the most valuable members that we have on our team. And if we had considered having written Scala before as a qualifier for being interviewed, we would have missed out on those people. The second one is, is that by acknowledging that the hard problems are going to be hard regardless of what language we're using, we've kind of gotten over this mental block towards choosing something new when market realities tell us that's the right decision to make. We're not so locked into the way we've been doing things that we, we are unable to change when that needs to happen. And you know, finally, being aware when things were not going well uh, with onboarding has meant that we've been able to iterate on that process and ultimately make it better. And by being open to learning new things individually and you know, making that a core part of our team culture, we've created something that I think is really unique in my employment experience of just this boldness to go and learn something new if, if that's what's called for. Now, that could be a new technology, but that's also proven to be a new part of our system. If it comes down to me having to bother somebody that's on PTO or me figuring out a new part of the system in order to try to fix a bug that we need fixed, our culture dictates that I choose this one over here, that I, 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 attack, I try to attack that problem first before just saying, oh, well, no, I don't know that. And I think that was, that's, that's an important culture point that, uh, it, you know, for me at least, makes Alimica a very um, interesting place to stay as an engineer. And so for those reasons, I, I would argue that ultimately pursuing new technologies, uh, pursuing learning as a core culture value, pursuing, um, you know, this, this kind of acknowledgement that hard problems are hard, regardless of what tools you're using to solve them, that these are things that are worthwhile to pursue for any organization, regardless of the context that, that you're operating in. And I'm saying that coming from a context of, you know, we're not playing in a sandbox. Like I mentioned earlier, like we're solving real problems by pursuing these values. And so that is a very brief version of my talk uh, because we're already getting close to time. And uh, I needed to kind of improvise a little bit. So I hope that everyone is still awake. Uh, and I thank you for listening. Um, and if you're interested, I would love to hear feedback. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you can email me. Uh, and you can check out my blog and my Twitter account. And uh, let me know what you think. So that's pretty much it. And if you have any questions, I'll take them.